I want to, I want to first read in so you don't make any mistake about it because in different seasons, right? How many, of you know, in different seasons, we need to emphasize different aspects of God's word, don't we? And so right now we're emphasizing, you know, uh, preparing ourselves. We're emphasizing laying aside weights and sins. We're emphasizing uh, repentance, turning to the Lord, a change in direction. How many of you understand what I'm saying? A change in direction. Where, where is uh, what Brother Rich prayed there? We're praying for God's increase and, and we are decreasing. That will be something that goes on the rest of our life, isn't it? I must decrease, so he must increase, right? It's called bearing fruit. It's called conforming to his image and will, Colossians says. And so, um, you know, because sometimes you're sharing these things. If you think, man, I want to hear something else. Look, I'm teaching and preaching here with an assumption that you already know that God loves you. That it'll never fail. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Uh, you know, his, his plan is, Beloved, I, I desire, I pray above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That's right, Third John 2, amen? Beloved, and the word wish, I was sharing with Rich the other day, it is not wish like wishful thinking, like the Bible says wish, I wish above all. It's not like man goes, I wish that happens for you, some, some unbeliever. The word wish is the word uh, uh it is the word pray. It is the word will. Okay. Will like the will of God, like the scripture says in first Timothy, uh, I desire and pray that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So how many of you believe that it's God's will for every human being to be saved, but it's not up to God, is it? They have to have faith, but it's, his desire, it's his will, it's what he died for. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes on him would not perish, but have everlasting eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to what? Condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life, everlasting life. But so um, it's, it's not God's decision who receives eternal life. Now, we know years ago, there were some preachers that got and started getting too smart for themselves, and they came up with all these ideas about predisposition and all that, and those are just theology things. But according to the word, it's God's will. He predestined all of us, everybody on planet Earth. Doesn't matter what island they're on today, God predestined every human being uh, to have eternal life because all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory. Amen? Everyone. Some guy in a remote jungle running around. He sinned. Guarantee you he sinned. Somebody in a, in a more sophisticated place sinned. So it says all have sinned because of what Adam did. For by one man. Amen? You came out of one man. It don't matter what color you are. Right? Like someone said, everybody bleeds red on the inside. The, the reality is, is it don't matter. See, that's, how, that's what Adam's sin did. It got you looking at the earth right? It got you looking earthly. Now, Jesus enacted and enabled you to be able to get your eyes back up on heaven. Scripture says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, right? That's in Hebrews. Hebrews, I believe, 10. Uh, he says, looking unto Jesus. No, excuse me, that, that uh, Hebrews 12, I believe. So anyway, looking unto Jesus, and, and the author and finisher, then, so where are your eyes supposed to be? On Jesus. Not on politics, not on man. Doesn't mean you don't look. That, that's not what I'm saying. But ultimately, your eyes are always a steady gazing look on him. That's what Moses said, didn't he? In, when the fiery serpents came in the wilderness, God said, build a brazen serpent, put it on a pole. Whoever looks on that pole, they won't be... Uh, 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 the, the bite of the fiery serpent won't kill him, but it'll be neutralized. And that's what Jesus actually said in John 3, 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up whoever looks on him. 
So as you keep looking, beholding, steadily gazing, attending to Jesus, then, then I'm just giving you some little scriptures. You can write them down and research them. Colossians 3 says, if you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are what? Above. Set your mind on things above. Or actually that word mind isn't just your thoughts, but it has the idea with thoughts and affection. So your affection is not to be on a, a car, a home, uh, a person, so to speak, uh, something material. Although you're to be affectionate toward all people, real godly affection can't flow out until you first have affection for him. Amen? Because when you look to him, the what happens is the, the bite of sin is neutralized. It becomes inoperative so that a pure love can flow out of you, right? Because once you experience the Father's love, you're able to commit the same love, aren't you? Now, here's a good example. So I want to reemphasize that so you know how much the Father loves us. See, I know that, but many times I assume. And I want to just read one or two scriptures that tells you. Let's go to one of my favorites that really transformed my life, Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Just let me read it to you real quick. Okay. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord appeared to me of old, saying, I've loved you with an everlasting love, and therefore with loving kindness have I drawn you. And then I'll add this for some of you that have been, you've had some damages in your life. I will build you again, and you'll be built, O virgin. And you shall again be adorned with your tablets, and you'll go forth and date dances. So Israel defiled himself many times, didn't he? And the Lord said, I will adorn you, O virgin. So the Lord sees you and I as a virgin through the blood of Jesus. Amen. He sees you pure. You, now, now what's important is you got to see yourself pure. Amen. And that's where like preparing yourself is important. Uh, so let me look at one more, one more, see if I can find this real quickly in the book of Psalms. Um, uh, Psalms 25. He says, uh, this is the psalmist now. And the psalmist didn't have a revelation like you have today. Okay, but he said this, verse 15, 20, 25, 15. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. Amen. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. Now, verse chapter 26, verse 3. For your loving kindness is before my eyes. I have walked in thy truth. Glory to God. God. Woo! Come on now. See, you should that should hit you. <laughs> now I'm gonna get sidetracked and start preaching on all this when I, that's not my purpose. I just want for you. The psalmist even said, My eyes. That's why he had such a powerful, powerful life, is because his eyes, even though once in a while he'd get a little bit challenged or he'd get sidetracked or or, or out of alignment in God's perfect will. David had a heart for God, man. Okay? That's it. Plain and simple. And you can have that same heart. You should be saying, I got a heart for God like Jesus. I got a heart for God like David. That's how you should see yourself. That's how I see myself. I mean, that's, you know, but I can't make, you have to see yourself in Christ. You got to see yourself with a heart for God, you know? And, and a lot of that gets down to being genuine with your walk with God. He knows your flaws. He knows your failures. He knows your challenges, but God doesn't want you telling, telling him about all your flaws and failures all the time. He wants you to be a better receiver of his grace, of his love, of his power. That's how you change. You don't change by constantly uh, acknowledging how weak you are. You have to acknowledge when you miss the mark, when you sin, when you yield to the flesh. But that's for humility purposes, not because God doesn't already know you missed it. It's so that you open yourself up for his assistance, his help, his grace that will lift you up out of that pit, lift you up out of that mindset, liberate you, and keep you walking on the path of righteousness. Amen? But the psalmist said, my eyes are ever towards you because you're loving kindness. So even though King David went through some really harsh stuff, he always had the Lord before him. Amen? He always saw the Lord before him, and, um, you know, there's no man like I was telling a brother last night, Pastor uh, Thad, I was, and another brother who started reading the Bible the other day, I said, you know, 
these people today, I saw something on the internet and I was talking about some preachers are bullies and this. And I'm thinking, dude, you need to take that liberal garbage out of here. You know nothing about the Bible because most Christians today would never be able to be under the administration of Moses. When Moses came down from, Moses had a serious temper. He broke those. I was just talking about the fact that Moses broke the tablets. See, and here's what I was saying. Moses was a killer on top of that. He killed an Egyptian while he was a prince. And, and see, the, the religious mind would try to get you to think that that was justified because he was saving a slave. No, murder, God said, thou shalt not kill. He never endorsed Moses to kill. Moses lost his cool, went into a rage, and killed that Egyptian. You know, that wasn't God's plan. God has other ways before. How many understand what I'm saying? There's only one judge is God. And, and, and the reality is Moses would do stuff. He had challenges, you know, for whatever reason. But God wasn't behind that. God didn't endorse that. Do you understand? And, and then Moses came down and he smashed the Ten Commandments. God didn't endorse that either. He could have came down and been angry and been upset and been frustrated and been challenged. He didn't have to break the commandments. God gave him another set. And then when he had come down, he saw them worshiping the calf. He burned the calf on fire. Then he ground it up in powder and made him drink it. So all these Christians that are in America today and around the world that think they got rough pastors, they would never be able to even be in the days of Jesus. Because Moses ground that calf up and said, you want to do that? Here, drink it all up, friend. I mean, imagine that. He was the first one to spike the Kool-Aid, friend. So, and I don't even, you know, that's how angry he was, you know. And, I, and God didn't tell him, burn that calf, grind it down, and make the people drink it. Come on, man. That was born by Moses, <laughs> you know. And Moses had it. Moses was the meekest man on, on planet Earth. So there was qualities of meekness. You know, when children of Israel sinned and God was going to judge them, Moses interceded. So there was a lot of things that Moses had, but if Moses lost his temper, man, it was a problem, right? It wasn't good. So um, there's different aspects of things that you and I need to understand so we get uh, an understanding of these people in the Word and, and God. And, and uh, they had challenges too. David, King David, look at this. Um, you know, uh, here's a good one. This is a good place to be in right now. Psalms 26, verse 2. Examine me, O Lord. Prove my heart and, my, and test my motives. If a lot of Christians would just pray that way today, we'd see a lot more transitioning, a lot more anointing, a lot more power flowing out, right? So David set a benchmark in a sense, and the Lord tells us the same thing. Amen? So now go over to Romans 8. Let's read Romans 8, and then we'll get to our move into our message. I'm saying this for you because I don't, I don't want you to get challenged or discouraged when we talk about things like end times or, or different things that are going on. So Romans 8, amen, in uh, verse 29. I'm going to start there. I'm going to read the Amplified. For those he foreknew of before he was aware of, he loved before, beforehand. For the foundation of the world. He also destined them from the beginning to be molded into the image of his son and share inwardly his likeness, that he might become the firstborn among many brethren. And those he foreordained, he called. He summons them. He invited them. He, he also justified them. He acquitted them. He made them righteous. Say, I'm righteous. He put them, God put them, into right standing with himself. And those he justified, he glorified. Say glorified. He raised them to a heavenly dignity and condition, a state of being. Isn't that good? God raised you and elevated you. You know, you hear people a lot of time go, I'm a sinner and I'm a this. No, you are speaking contrary to God's word. God says he raised you to a heavenly righteous condition, a state of being. That's what you find. Glory to God in the new covenant. Who you are in Christ is that God raised you. You didn't raise yourself. God raised you. You can stand before God the Father today without a sense of guilt, condemnation, shame, as though sin never existed because of what Jesus did. 
because of what his blood has done for you and is still doing today. You can stand before the Father. But then at the same time, we have our relationship with him. That's our position. Amen? Our position will not change unless we quit the company, so to speak. You get my point? My position won't change unless I change my position. And there are those who have gone away from Christ and have chosen not to maintain uh, um, their position in Christ, right? The Bible teaches us that. They counted the blood of Christ an unholy thing and went away. And therefore, there is no more repentance for them. Okay? Now, a lot of people get confused about these things. They think, oh, my God, I did the unpardonable sin. I was talking with Pastor Eric last night. And, you know, all these things, you know, like people live in a lot of guilt, condemnation, and shame because they're uneducated in the word. Right? Uh, I don't think any of us have done the unpardonable sin, <laughs> you know, which is blasphemy against the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's not you sinned and, oh, my God, I did, you know, I can remember when I first was a Christian. If I sinned or did something, man, man, I was just under tremendous guilt, condemnation, thinking I lost my salvation, you know, and all these things. And that, that's not the case, you know. Um, you you got to grow up into him. And sometimes that's a process of laying aside weights and sins, the Bible says. Weights and sins. Some things are weights. They're just burdens and bondages. And then sins are things that you do directly in disobedience to God's will when you know not to do it, right? So nonetheless, your position with God is this. He raised you to heavenly dignity. So then it says, what shall you say to all these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who will be your foe if God's on your side? Verse 32, he who did not withhold and spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not freely and graciously give you all other things? Who's going to bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies and puts you in right relation. Who's going to impeach you, glory to God? <laughs> who can impeach you out of your place in Christ? Nobody. You can't be voted out. I can't vote you out of Christ. I can't just... Go collect a bunch of ballots and have people sign and go, man, brother Jim, I need to get, nope, I don't like him anymore. And just sign them, get them, everybody to have, and God go, yep, you got 5,000 signatures. He's out of here. Come on. They can't vote you out. You can end up in a pig pen and, and they can't vote you out. Amen. So that's your position in Christ. All right. Who will bring any charge? Who will come forward and impeach those whom God has chosen? Okay. Then it says, verse 35, I'll read it for you. Who's going to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ? Will suffering, affliction, troubles, calamities, persecutions, right? And then it goes on and tells you, uh, you know, height, depth, or any other thing. Nothing will separate you. If God's for you, guess what? Who can be against you? <laughs> Excuse me. That's your position in Christ. Now, your fellowship is what needs to be addressed. Because we have a lot of teaching about our position. And the problem with that that's gone on and why we're in America and the times we're in now is because people have emphasized their position as an as a, as a, um, option away from a lifestyle. See, your position that I just read should then cultivate and create a lifestyle. Amen. Of holiness of commitment, of loyalty, of power, of dominion, of, of, of walking in a higher level. Isn't this true? Your position. So what we've had in America for the last little bit is we've had a lot of emphasis on position. And so people have just dismissed that, you know, we can't, we, you know, it doesn't matter if I do this, I can do what I want. Well, that's an actual doctrine in the Bible. It's called Gnosticism. It's Gnosticism. And this is what Paul fought against, right? Gnosticism and then the doctrine of Balaam, which I've been teaching on a little bit, as well as uh, uh, the Nicolaitans, right? The Nicolaitans, right? And, um, and their mindsets. Um, I don't know what I did with my little tab, but anyway. Um, so what I want to emphasize is this. First, go over to the book of Jude. I want to go to the book of Jude, and then I'm going to go to some of the things that you and I should be doing to preparing ourselves. 
So when we said all that, that's your position in Christ. Well, then let's find out what God says about his coming right now. And because a lot of people right now may not even be teaching on that. How many people you hear bring up Jude and 2 Peter and 1 Peter? Nope. You know why? These, these books right here, and here, here's something I asked this pastor last night. I said, brother, this is the problem we have. How many of you know there's lots of wonderful promises by God's love? God so loved the world. So if I read you all the red letters about God's love in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, right? And everybody wants the dessert, so to speak. All the things that the Father wants to do for us, right? Uh, prosper you, be in health, uh, be successful, be abundant, all those things. But does the Father at the same time have the right in his love to keep you structured, to give you a protocol to follow. Does he? Well, there's a lot of people that don't want that. They don't want God's protocol. They only want the dessert. And that's where America's at, friend. And I'm going to show you what the scriptures say. So the problem is just like I read you last week. I read you last week, and that's a lot of churches in San Francisco and in America. And I'll tell you what it creates. It creates a weakness. It creates a fear where you shut your door during COVID. It creates all the other insane things you're seeing going on in the world today. I will show you scripturally, right? I don't care what this guy says on a platform. Someone told me this other preacher the other day who has a platform and a big ministry is walking with BLM. What you marching with them for? They're opposed to, to, to the scripture. See, compromise, trying to make people feel you know like like you know they're accepted brother i accept you i don't care what race you is you either a believer or an unbeliever that's it <laughs> that's all i look at you either in christ or you're out of christ that's it i don't care what race you're from what nation you're from that has no bearing on my eyes i only care are you in christ or are you out of christ that's all that matters to me I don't care who you know, what you know, how much money you got in your bank, what kind of degrees you got, what kind of, you know, patches you got, what kind of this you got, what your history was, what your record was. Uh, you know, you was in the stock market 20 years. You were there. No, listen, man, that's all going to burn. Wood, hay, and stubble. None of that is presentable to God. The only thing that you can present to God is when you stand before him is you can just say, I agree with the blood of Jesus. Because the blood qualified you. Amen? The blood qualified you. That's what it says in first in, in Colossians uh, chapter 1. Giving thanks unto the Father who qualified us. I didn't qualify myself. You know? I didn't qualify myself. He put me in the race. He qualified my time for me. Right? Who qualified us and made us to be sharers and partakers. So, uh, where did I tell you to go? Jude. Let's look at Jude. I want to just read some of these things to you. This is how, the, and, and just so you and I know, so we have a right perspective of what's going on because, you know, we can't, and my question is, is this the same Holy Spirit that's in all the other great wonderful verses? You know, people love all the other, the other great wonderful verses, but then when it comes to these other verses, they like dismiss them. My question is, is it the same love? Is it is Jesus have the same love that's, you know, when he died and shed his blood and he says, you know, I raised you to a heavenly dignity. You're acceptable. I'll never leave you and forsake you. If I'm for you, who can be against you? I'm on your side. I love you with an everlasting love. All things work together for good because you love me and you're called karma. Is that same love there? The same love we find in the book of Jude and Second Peter and Peter and, and, and the other places in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21. Is, is that the same Jesus is my question? Yeah. Yes, it is. But there's a lot of believers that won't receive these other texts. And so they are wayward. And they have a form of godliness but no power. And I don't want to get into it. Actually, I will just read this one part since I had it to pull it up real quick. Acts 20, before I get to Jude, uh, Acts 20, 
and I'm going to read, I read it on Tuesday. It, and Paul says uh, in verse 18, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, you know, from the first day, I want you to hear this theme right now, that the first day that I came to Asia after what manner I have been among you at all seasons. This, this speaks to me that the apostle Paul was consistent in every season. He was consistent to tell them about the love of God. He was consistent to warn them. He was, inconsist he was consistent to encourage them. He gave them all the parameters of living in Christ and living for God, not just an overbalanced. How many understand? He says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by lying in wait of the Jews. And how, listen, I kept back nothing that was profitable to you. Mm, therein is a problem. Profitability. Some people think that profitability is only telling people about how they can be successful, how they can lose weight, how they can flourish in the earth. They get their eyes on all the earthly, essential things. They think that's profitability. No, 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 no. Godliness is profitable. What do you mean by godliness? Godlikeness. Is God like is godliness mean you don't smoke cigarettes? Does godliness have to do with anything external? But I'll tell you this: if some things are right in order on the inside, there will be godlike traits and qualities that show up in a believer's life. What are those godlike traits and qualities? Well, you, they're called the fruits of the spirit: love, joy peace, goodness, gentleness, meekness, patience, faithfulness. They'll show up. Right? They'll show up. Now, I would suspect, you know, there you know, uh there's probably some areas of rotten fruit that need to get pruned away in our lives, but for a majority there should for for if a believer's been walking with God for a period of time, there should be some of those fruits that are showing up. There should be those qualities and characteristics of Jesus. And here's one of them that I, I think is important in this hour. Faithfulness. And actually the Bible says, who can find a faithful man? I'm not talking to, to relations. I'm talking with God. I'm talking with God because the actual scripture tells us, and, and uh, brother T Pastor Tony brought it up this week when I was up in there, and he said, you know that scripture, we only quote half of it. It says, and they overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That's only half the verse. The other half says, and they love not their lives unto death. So what's going to happen in the times to come when some of these things go on and the abomination of desolation is set up in the third temple. And they come and they say, you haven't taken the mark. Are you going to be faithful unto death? Because that's where it's headed. I'm not saying tomorrow or in a year. I, I, but you are headed that way right now. You are in that season. I don't care if platform preacher says, no, we're not. He is a liar. He is a liar. Like in the book of Jeremiah, when they when the Hananiah came and said, Hey, you Jews, God's deliverance is at hand. We're going to be released from Babylon. And Jeremiah came and said, Not so, partner. And that Hananiah broke the yoke off Jeremiah's neck. And he said, Just as that yoke is broke, God has broken the bondage of Israel in Babylon. You'll be free. And as he, Jeremiah walked off, the Lord went spoke to him, said, go back and tell him, I have not sent you. You deceive the people and you lie and you'll die in a year. I read it Tuesday, false prophet. And Jeremiah said, buy property, buy land right now because you're going to be here for a while to the day appointed of your deliverance. Lying prophets, okay? I'm safe, not because I'm so perfect, but I'm working out my salvation. I, I'm, 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 I, it's the goodness of God. See, the Lord's like, Dave, when you're teaching on repentance, make sure that you have the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. It's not my fear. Of, it, it, there is a reverence. 
but it's God's goodness that's going to bring a change. It's God's goodness that leads to repentance, to change and transformation. But let's be truthful. They love not their lives. That's where we're headed, folks. We need to be prepared. The church needs to get back to a place of power, of dominion, where we're not loving our earthly life. You know, you see all the worldly people, you say, how you doing? Just loving life, loving life. Jesus never said to love life. He never said love life. Do you know that? He said love people. Glory to God. What do you love? People. You love bringing people to Jesus. You love having a cup of coffee with your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is what excites you. You're involved in their life. They're involved in yours. But it never told you love life. I mean, thank God. It's like I was talking to Brother Jim. I was like, man, I want to get a motorcycle later on and and then take a ride up in the mountains. I mean, man, but I'll tell you something. That's not the pinnacle of what my life means. You know what it would mean? It, and I was like, yeah, we got to get some other guys a bike too. The pinnacle, it's like this. When I went to England my first time, and I sat in this house where I was ministering at this Bible school, and I'm just praying and reading all the time. And the person said, hmm, you don't, you don't want to go to any of the tourist sites? I said, nope. I'm not here for that. I woke up every day and spent two, three, four, five hours in my room praying and reading. I wasn't there for tourism, dude. There's a lot of preachers that go to other nations and they, they're on a, like Brother Mark said, he says, they, they tell you they're on a mission trip, but really they're on a missing trip because they're sightseeing everywhere. I don't really care about sightseeing. I only wanted to go to the Louvre and see the art gallery, and I went there twice. I went to the Eiffel Tower, went, mm -mm, great, fine, later. I've been, to, I've been to Buckingham Palace, all those places. I mean, like, I saw all of London one time. I did it all in like an hour. I don't really, I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, great, okay, fine. I'm not moved by all that. My mind is not occupied. My mind is moved by what God's doing and with people and the opportunities to minister. That's, see, Jesus actually told you. He told you, uh, uh, what shall a man profit if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? He told you about, right, uh, what was that verse he said about uh, love not, uh, First John, love not the world or the things that are in the world. For all that's in the world, right, it's not a God. You ain't supposed to look like, ooh, I love my car. I love, no, you don't. Your car can't love you back. Amen. So we have to define these things so that you and I are like King David. Our hearts, like Paul told Timothy, give yourself wholly to these things that thy what? Profiting would what? Come on. Your profiting would appear at all. You got to tell no one you were Christian. Amen and praise the Lord and hallelujah. You're profiting. There'll be a presence of God's glory emanating through your life. You'll have a form of godliness. When they say you're, they're sick, you'll reach out and lay hands on them. You'll pray for them when they're struggling, when they're having a headache, when they're having a hard time, when they're struggling in a relationship, when they feel condemned. You will tell them, but you will show them and demonstrate and carry the presence of God into somebody's life and bring them to a place of salvation. Amen? Now, Paul said this. Let me hurry up, because i got to get this. He says this. I've not kept back anything, but I've showed unto you and taught you publicly and house to house, testifying to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we jump down, and verse 27, he says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, just what we're talking about, not just the desserts, not just the desserts. As a matter of fact, I want to read you. I'm gonna, we're we're going to go to Jude. I'm just going to read you where Paul told Timothy so you can you, give you a reference to that verse. Um, Second Timothy, or excuse me, First Timothy, sorry. Um, First Timothy 4.15, give yourself wholly to these things and your profiting 
will appear to all. Take heed unto yourself, for in doing so you'll save yourself and others. He says, you'll give yourself wholly. That means don't hold nothing back. Don't hold nothing back from God. Give yourself wholly. Like, here's the thing. I'm going to tell you something. You know, we teach about tithing. We try to teach people tithing in the world. Tithe because God wants to reward you and give back to you. That's partially. But do you know King David gave everything? He said, I'm not giving to God. I'm just giving what belongs to you, brother. How many of you know that? See, we try to teach people and kind of get them to tithe. And some people, well, tithing's of the Old Testament. Right there, they've already disqualified. Their heart ain't no good. No, they're not. Because they don't realize that everything belongs to God. So if God tells you today, hey, brother, give that motorcycle away. Are you going to obey him? Or are you going to just say, it's mine. I work for this. It's mine. It belongs to me. It's mine, Lord. But I'll go to church, raise my hands, and do everything else. Will I follow through? Will I obey? That's what God wants to know. That's what he wants to work. I'm not saying he's going to have you give it away, but he will ask you to distribute things. Because God's nature is a giver. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I can think about many cars I gave away, and I don't, I don't think anybody's given me a car. I'm not sitting around waiting for one, though. You know what I mean? I'm not saying, oh, man, I hope I get a car. I hope I get a harvest on that. I mean, I'm sure it'll roll in someday, literally. You know what I mean? You never know. I mean, God's faithful, but I'm not sitting around. But my point is, is God has called on me many times. And the thing is, I'm not looking, but we have to condition our heart so it's always in a place. And that may be a crude example because there's deeper things. Like, go talk to that brother across the street right now. He has a need. Or tell that brother the truth. That brother right there is stuck. Don't compromise the truth, but tell him the truth in love. Tell that brother he's in a wrong place, going down a wrong road. You know, don't be afraid because the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever puts their trust in God, safe will he be. Now here, look at Jude. Over in Jude now, I was looking at this the other day. He tells you right here in verse 3, earnestly contend for the faith. Contend for that faith right now. You've got to contend. For verse 4, for there are certain people crept in. Uh, they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness he says i'm going to put you in remembrance of these things so there are those people that take the grace of god and use it as what would be called sloppy grace that means that's like gnosticism right i know my position in god but then outwardly there's no fruit i just utilize and say i'm under grace which is a false doctrine right it's, it's, it, it's found in Romans uh, chapter 3, right? When it talks about grace in Romans 3. He says, because of grace, should I therefore sin more? Should I just live? Well, the, the one I'm talking about is right here in, in Romans 3. Hold on a sec. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Six. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace, God forbid? Should I just continue to live any way I want just because I say I'm under grace? Do I use God's grace? Now, that doesn't mean, huh? Certainly not. But that doesn't mean that I want to become very religious or on the left or the right. How many of you know? I don't want to be loose, but I don't want to be so over-religious that I'm not living under grace. Because that happened too, didn't it? So why is, see, there's all these mentalities and mindsets that Christians have. We know that happened because they did it over in the book of Galatians. They fell from grace. They got real religious, right? They started depending on themselves again. And the apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, said, uh, I want to remind you, Jesus was crucified. You started your life spiritually depending and trusting on him, but now you've dropped back into trusting yourself, your own works, how good you are, how many hours you pray, how many hours you do this or do that. And you end up like the church of Laodicea and you say, I have needed nothing. Everything's hunky dory and I'm fine and dandy. And Jesus goes, America? No, I don't think so. I think you're, you're naked. You say you're clothed. I, I say you're naked. 
They go, nah, man, we're all good, Jesus. We are blessed, blessed, blessed. Everything's hunky-dory and fine and warm. Jesus said, no, I see the church closed. The church is supposed to be open. They go, no, we're just obeying the government, though, Jesus. And Jesus goes, no, 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 man, that opened the doors. You get my point? But why is that? Because they're naked. They don't see correctly. They don't see accurately. So he says, I counsel you to buy me gold tried by fire that you and anoint your eyes. So that tells you that they're seeing, come on now, is inaccurate. What they're looking at is wrong. So Jesus says, get some of this anointing, place it on your eyes so that now you'll really see my perspective, how I see things. And see, you'll always find people that combat what I'm saying right here. But that's why I said, can you combat the scripture? So once I put the Bible in front of them, they have to renounce the Bible then. Then you're not a Christian. You cannot renounce holy canonized scripture in ops to accommodate your own emotions, your own feelings, or your own lifestyle. That's called heresy. And that's what we have. And we have that coming from the pulpit in a lot of places in America. And that's why it says this. Here you go. You ready? I'm just preparing you. I'm not saying anything that ain't in the Bible. Am I? Here, read it. Right here in Jude. Contend. Because he says there's people that crept in. Notice what he said. They crept in. So they were there. They're part of the assembly, man. These aren't like people on the outside. They're part of it. They're living amongst them. It says, uh, let me get over to this amplified part. So here you go. You ready? He goes in right here. I'm going to show you. These people, verse 7, I'm not going to get into all, but these, this is end time, which uh, they gave themselves, they indulged in unnatural vice, sensual perversity, which I'm not saying that's sex, but sensual, just sensuality. I just want you to hear their theme. It says, giving themselves to fornication, going after strange flesh. These guys, uh, Enoch prophesies, they corrupt, reject authority, reject government, right? Revile and libel and scoff at heavenly glories. They're dreamers. Uh, you, you go on and says, oh, here are three things they've done. They uh, run righteously after the way of Cain. What did Cain do to Abel? Look at, don't just look at the works of Cain. Look at Cain's heart. They have abandoned themselves for the sake of gain, like, like Balaam. They perished in the rebellion of Korah. Right? Now look, clouds without water. Swept away by winds, that, that means every doctrine Ephesians says. Okay, now here's my whole point of emphasizing this, and I want to get to Second Peter and a couple of the verses, then I'll close it up. This is the Bible, folks. This is the Bible. This is the same love that they see. I, I don't focus on all those because I, I realize they're there. But if I'm truly fellowshipping and loving God, then guess what? My house will be in order. <laughs> Won't it? I'm not going to burn down buildings. I'm not going to have racial issues. No, you're not. You're not going to have all these problems you have in the earth. And a lot of those people out there say they believe in Jesus, but they don't. No, they don't. Because you can't believe in Jesus and, and be contrary to his word. You cannot. You understand? You cannot say you believe in Christ and have a mindset lifestyle totally contrary to his word. You cannot. And that's why the times we're in now, the veneer is stripped away. God is calling his body to a place of, of being set apart, being sacred. Come on now. Preparing them, holy, preparing them for his coming. But what's coming down the pipe, friend, is serious business. And there's a lot of people who say, man, that brother's crazy. I'm crazy for telling you the scriptures, I guess. Okay, great. So go find you a pastor and a preacher 
you know, that just tells you all the desserts. And then when you stand before Jesus and when the abomination desolation sets itself up in the third temple and they knock on your door and say, hey, aren't you one of those people? Are you going to receive the mark? Someone says, is the COVID chip the gun bar? I don't think so. But the reality is there's going to be an opportunity for you to receive a mark in your forehead or on your hand. And that is the mark of Antichrist. And are you going to receive that mark is the question. And justify and rationalize, or will you hold fast to what the scriptures say? Now that could be in a year, two years, five, ten. It's going to be in a time frame. Do you understand? We're headed in those directions. And you don't want to go in. Now, I'm not afraid at all because I already know what I'm doing. God, I'm not going with Democrats, Republicans. I'm not going with race. I'm not going with this populist opinion. I don't even care if family member go the other way. That's your problem. I'm going with God. I'm telling you, I ain't bowing out to no family opinion. I, my mom decides to take the mark. Hey, bye. I pray God that I'm not going to take it, but I'm going to be prepared. So when they come to the door, I'll be like, just like they came here. And I said, I've been expecting you to show up at my door. Remember, I said it. I've been expecting you already. I'm ready. I've already played it all out in my mind. What you going to do? Send me a fine? Take me to jail? What You're not going to stop the re revelation of serving God and honoring him and, and trapping me into your mindset. I'm not... I'm, not going to be trapped into that. I'm going to go with my father. Now, I did it nicely. I didn't, wasn't mean or rude, but I'm expecting you. And I'm expecting Jesus to be all he said. That that trumpet will sound. Hey, hey, the Lord himself shall descend with a shout. Glory to God. <laughs> with a grand entrance, baby. Come on now. I don't know when that's going to be, but it's going to be guaranteed. It's going to be. So look what Jude says. I, I got to get this to you, and I'm going to read. He says, look, in verse, uh, verse 12, they're sports in your feast of love. So they were at the Lord's Supper. I'm just showing you. These are all people, clouds and all this. But here's what I want you to see. I want you to see right here. Um, Enoch, oh, oh, here, how about this part? Wandering stars. I, I'm not even going to go into it. Just, this is the same Jesus, the same Holy Spirit, friend. Actually, Jude is the brother of Jesus. Read it. This is Jesus' biological brother. You understand? It came from Mary's womb. How many of you know that? That after Jesus was born, Mary had two other children. It's documented, James and Jude. Okay, they, they weren't from God. They were from uh natural birth the husband name joseph they were joseph's son jude is the brother of jesus natural biological and james there's two jameses there james which was the brother of john and then james who wrote the book of james is the brother of jesus who was also a pastor so he says this and enoch the seventh prophesied listen behold the lord cometh see the lord cometh so it jumped now, look, he goes on and says, I I'm not going to read you, to execute judgment upon all those and convince of their ungodliness and deeds and the things they've committed and all these murmurers and complainers walking after. Now, I want to read you this. Walking uh, their own desires, their own passions, and they admire men's personage. This is what jumps out at me a lot, too. They pay people flattering compliments to gain advantage. That means you, you're kissing up to people. You know, like if some politician or some person or somebody famous comes. Who cares? Do you know Jesus? We don't care if you're famous. Do you know Christ? Are you in Christ? Are you the righteousness of God? Are you walking in the commandment of truth? Are you walking in God? Are you walking according to his counsel? Who cares that you got a big church and you drive a Rolls Royce? What does that got to do with the fact 
do are you walking in the reality of revelation now men's personage and being admiring people amen why for gain let me get close to that person so i can find a way to access something they got brother god's your provider god's your healer god's your source god's your strength never minimize yourself to gain something in the earth amen that's weak you can't even live with yourself like that to be honest if you're a real christian you can't live inside how many how many you know god's your source just like abraham when when abraham went to the slaughter he said nah because later on you're gonna say that you gave me this but only god provided for me god was my source god is my provider right so look at this let me hear it let me let me go he says because I, I got a point i want to get to uh verse uh 18 they told you before remember what the apostle said in the last days there'll be scoffers who gratify their own desire following after their own ungodly so if if love is godly then ungodliness would be hatred if if uh you know so what is ungodly just anything not a god you know a bad attitude is not godly anything that's not godly anything not godly just just it doesn't mean what just anything not godly just imagine how jesus is so whatever's not like jesus is ungodly and all you got to know to 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 see what God looks like, just look at Jesus. I mean, it's real simple. Sickness is ungodly. Poverty and lack and, and weakness is ungodly. Weakness is not, weakness is not a godly quality. It's not a godly quality. People go, I'm just so weak. It's ungodly, friend. It's ungodly. The Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Never say, be weak. God never celebrates weakness. He says, let the weak say I'm what? Strong. No one would ever tell you that weakness is ungodly. Why? Because there's a lot of weak people. No, you know what I'm saying? Weak spiritually. So they're weak and they're struggling and then people go, it's okay, it's okay. And they think they're real godly and pious. But they're not, according to the scriptures. Because if the Lord said, be strong, he never said there's an option. Did the Lord say, it's okay to be weak? Go ahead. I just died so you can be weak and you can kind of piddle diddle through and struggle all the time and kind of ride a roller coaster. Now, God loves us, but does he accept that is what I'm saying. He, he loves me. But he doesn't accept that aspect. <laughs> like when I was going on the crutches the other day coming out, and I was like, man, this is a burden. I was like whining to myself almost. I was like, this is just, man, Lord, talking to the Lord. And the Lord's like, you could be missing a leg doing this. I was like, amen, Lord. Absolutely, 100%, Father. Thank you. Forgive me whining like a little whiner. That's how I correct. See, and I was telling my mom, but I never hear the Lord just validate my little thinking i i never i they never i never once hear the lord justify my erroneous thinking i never hear the lord go you know it's all right dave really you are struggling and it's real this is challenging on you dave you know really i never heard the one lord come to that aid once there's always some line of love that comes he didn't say it mean he said you could be hobbling around like a lot of other people with no legs and when he said that, I just saw a picture like, wow, yeah, Lord, I need to get grateful real quick, don't I? Because your mind is one minute this way and feeling this and feeling, but, but your mind is not correct. Do you understand? Your thoughts many times are not right. And so it just takes a little prompting by the Holy Spirit, a little nudging just to bring you back to an attitude of gratitude and to give you the right perspective on things, right? Like that you're very healthy. Like the other day I was sitting there, I was thinking, oh, I was just sitting there thinking, kind of roaming in my mind. The Lord said, do you know there's a lot of people that would love to be in the position you're in?
You can go find someone in another third world country right now. They say scooter. Oh, I love that scooter. Telephone, bottle of water, food in your belly, man, roof over your head. Do you know how I've been sleeping? With a tin roof over my head, water coming in and dirt, cockroaches and everything. Heater. Oh, man, I love that heater. Well, all we got is Top Ramen. Top Ramen? Ooh, I love Top Ramen. There's a lot of people like that. It's all about your condition. So my point is, is keeping the condition of your heart right. Let me hurry up right here. Because I got something I want you to see. It says right here, this part right here, I want you to see this. And then I'm going to hit the uh, second Peter and I'll close it up. Here you go. These are they, how they told you, mockers in the last time. Mockers. Do you think there's mockers in the earth today? There's mockers right now. They might even mock this when they see it. It won't matter to me. It ain't going to bug me. So I'll be crying when they take the mark of the beast. Uh, it is these agitators. Now I want you to hear. They're worldly minded, verse 19, devoid of the Holy Spirit and destitute. And when I read this this week, see, I was saying, it says they're sensual. Sensuality. What is sensuality? Sensuality. Now, now go to Second Peter. or Second Peter, I just want to show you. I'm not going to be able to read it all. But the Lord prompted me, actually, First Peter. He prompted me on this verse, and I heard it in my spirit. First uh, Peter 4. <laughs> Chapter 4. Now I want you to read the first three, three verses on your own later. But in verse, verse 17, you should read all this chapter and be very familiar with it because it has a famous part in it. But it says, for the time has come if judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment at the house of God. And it first begins with us. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? For if the righteous scarcely be saved, where will the godly and unsinner appear? Here's my question. This is the time we're living in, friend. Now, now I want to I want to take you up. I want to take you up to this verse. Because if you go on the internet today, you're going to see every person preach this verse. They love this verse. And rightly so. That's 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Above all things, have fervent love among yourselves. Love covers a multitude of sins. People love that. Oh, man, everyone, that's a safe verse to preach. It's easy to preach that. Everybody loves that. Love covers a multitude. It's okay to be sensual. Love covers. It forgives a multitude. It's easy to share that. That's not offensive. Nobody is offended by that. And I saw something the other day, and I said, stop, please, stop. I was listening to someone. Stop trying to bridge the gap between the carnal world and the realm of the spirit. They'll never mix. See, you can't accommodate the world and all its ungodliness with trying to make Christianity all-inclusive to it. Do you understand that? It doesn't work. The gospel is contrary towards man's earthly pursuits. Do you understand that? It's contrary. It don't fit. And what's happened in America is there's come about a sensual church. That way, it became all-inclusive, accommodating, unoffensive. It doesn't challenge the heart of faith. And they have these intellectuals that speak, but yet the people are left untransformed, unchanged. Door closed in COVID, shut down. Independence and, and just even talking about this is part of God, that, like God's doing this. And we'll all just get through it together. Mm -hmm. Together. That was the world's message. Together. 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 Stop taking a spiritual... The world. We'll get through it. Okay, Tower of Babel. 
flesh. You still ain't got through it. It's like how many months later? All the commercials came out. We'll get through this together. I'm not looking for my neighbor to help me get through. I'm not looking at some worldly, unsaved person who just wants to chime in and try to find some level of unity to get me through the COVID. I'm looking for believers endeavoring to keep the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. I'm not looking for some natural person. They can't help me. They can't help you. Now you can know, and I, I, I might have relaxed a little, but I can tell you by the grace of God, I've, I've never vacillated away from day one about COVID. Torch and scorch, burn it. You know, I, I, I'll be honest, I've simmered myself down for you guys. But I, I, if, I, if I don't believe in the power of the gospel, I throw this book away and go live. Why would I want this book if I don't believe that God's able to preserve my life and keep me immune? Why do I need God then? Take me to heaven when I die, but while I'm on earth, I have to be subjugated to everything else? That's not what the scriptures teach. So here you go, 2 Peter, 2 Peter, here it is, we're closing. I want you to see this in 2 Peter, though, that it tells them judgment starts at the house of God. That doesn't mean people are going to hell, but it means, what is judgment? It is to assess. It is to define, right? It, it, it's like you go in your basement and you go, this thing right here has been sitting here for like four years. I haven't touched it. It's unprofitable. It's no good. Throw it in the dumpster. Get rid of it. Taking up space. Judgment is to assess the value of it and then get rid of it. And that's what God says. It starts right now. It's been happening with the church. So look, I'll give you two, two, two verses and we'll get out of here. Let me see. Second uh, Peter... Uh, let's see. I want to find something that ties in. With, uh, here you go. I'm gonna read this. You ready? Uh, here it goes right here. Once again, Second Peter says the same thing. Chapter two, verse thirteen. He tells them their sports with blemishes and and with their own deceivings while they feast with you. And they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it a pleasure to riot in the daytime, spots, blemishes, sporting, deceiving, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling, unstable souls. Now, we have to weigh this. A heart exercise with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and gone and followed the way of Balaam, son of Bosor, who loved the ways of righteous, but was rebuked for his inequity by a dumb ass, speaking with a man's voice, forbidding the madness. Wells without water, clouds, great swelling words. Verse 19, they promise liberty, but their servants to corruption. For whom a man is overcome, the same is brought into bondage. Okay. Now go to First Thessalonians and I close. Guarantee you we're closing. Here you go. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter five. We don't have time because you guys want to go. So here we go. We're going to go to verse six. We're going to read verse four. And then I'm going to read. But brethren... But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day will overtake you by surprise. You're not children of the night. Be sober. Verse 9, God has not appointed you to wrath, but to obtain. Now comfort one another. Edify one another. Verse 12, brethren, know them that labor amongst you and are over you in the Lord. Know them. Understand them. And esteem them highly for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now, here it is, verse 14. We exhort you, warn the unruly, warn them.
comfort the feeble-hearted, the faint-hearted. Support the weak and be patient. Don't return evil for evil. Read the list later. Point I'm telling you, God tells you how to bring those out. And matter of fact, in Jude tells you this. The last part of Jude I didn't read. See, the amazing thing about God is I didn't read that part of Jude where it says they're sensual, have they not the spirit? But then he goes on later and says, on some have compassion, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment spotted by the flesh. See, even though we're sharing these truths, my whole emphasis to you is understand this. These same books are not to be rejected. They are to be received, valued, honor and highly esteemed just like every other good word that is in the bible when you do that you will leave the form of godliness and you'll have a power like there's some churches i couldn't even read second peter in they don't want to hear it they only want to hear what jesus can do for them they've minimized jesus and brought him down to their standard and they will not make it through the the times multitudes multitudes I shared this with a guy the other day. Are in the valley of decision. The Lord is near. Multitudes. That's what the Lord gave me in prayer. And then he gave me that other verse. I heard it in my ear. And he said, be patient, therefore, brethren, for the coming of the Lord draws near. Now, when the Lord says that, be patient. Just be patient. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep loving people. But put an emphasis on you making sure, as Peter said, your calling and election are sure. Put an emphasis on being wholly committed to Jesus. Put an emphasis on your family members, bringing them to Christ right now. Put an emphasis on brothers and sisters who are making pitiful excuses as to why they're still being sensual. Help correct them and bring them back to a place snatch them out of the fire do you hear me relatives and, and people that justify and rationalize their behavior and their excuses snatch them out man tell them the truth tell them the truth with love say i'm not going to swallow that mumbo jumbo brother i love you man but what you do with the message is on you amen so they can be a house built up together on fire. Amen. Then they won't be sitting around. Are you going to receive the offering, Maria? Then we're, you won't be sitting around waiting for the government to give you a vaccination. Look at all these people. They just, they're up here listening to the enemy. And a lot of Christians agree with that garbage. They say they're Christians, but they're not. Because there's only one government. It's Jesus's. That is it. And, and the church has to come to a place of rendering their hearts and repentance in this hour this, for, this, for God to do what he wants. If not, there's going to be believers being left behind. I'm telling you now. Just read. I, I challenge you. Go read this week all on your own. Go read Revelation. Go read Second Peter. Go read First Peter. I mean, and go listen to the messages people are preaching on the Facebook and all over. I'm thinking... How come no one's talking about Jesus coming? Things are being prepared. <laughs> well, you and I can sit back and go, man, we're safe. But I tell you, we got work to do. People are worried about people dying of COVID. I'm worried about you dying. I'm worried about you going to hell. And I'm saying that even to people in my own camp. I'm, I'm not concerned about you dying of COVID, friend. I'm concerned about you being lost in eternal damnation and thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity. This earth is temporal, friend. I'm concerned about it. Hell is a real place. You don't go to hell because you're bad. You go to hell for rejecting Jesus Christ, rejecting his life given in exchange for yours. That's the message. If someone doesn't want to receive it, I can't make them receive it. We didn't even get to it. I kind of got sidetracked. But I'm just telling you, we're in the great times right now. You and I, this is like the Olympics for us. Don't be afraid. 
The devil is roaming and working and conniving and lying and manipulating and twisting and distorting. Okay? The world is in a very funky place right now. The church is in a rocky place. I don't care if you go on Facebook today and see some guy gave it some little successful message. That is not the message of the hour right now. The message of the hour is get rid of the sensuality, get things in alignment with God's will, start doing the work of the ministry, holding out the word of life this generation, bringing the glory in the earth. That's why God is sitting back watching and looking. His eyes are roaming, looking for those that can be used and be vessels of honor right now in this hour. Amen. There's so much more, but don't sit back naive thinking it's all just going to pan out after the elections. Everything's fine and dandy and hunky dory and this. I, I, the devil's not done. Is he ever done? He's looking to steal, kill, and destroy. And the more believers he can just tone down and get them sensual. And, but, but see, that's why you have the sensual churches. They won't go into these verses. They just want to talk about just love everybody. Just love everybody. How do you love somebody? And, and Chloe, come on, Marie, come up here and receive offering. How do you love somebody? Someone tell me. How do you love somebody? The greatest way to love somebody, tell me. What is the truth, though? The greatest way. Tell them they're a sinner and that Jesus died for their sins and gives eternal life. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory. The greatest way I can love Kim is not just buy him a cup of coffee. It's to tell him where his, that his need so that he doesn't leave this earth without knowing his Savior. That's the greatest aspect of love. For God so loved that he gave. The greatest aspect is to tell someone about God's love for them that was demonstrated on the cross, not just by giving them a cookie. <laughs> That's part of it. Amen. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.